believe. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say to Herman, uh, I, I plan on coming to your church. Feel free. Yes, I, I look Feel forward free. to it. Yeah, I would have been there Sunday, but I also had some car problems. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Did you get a take yeah. care of? It, it, it's good now, though. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, uh, the three of you are candidates for position four on the Portland School Board. And I thought we'd just start off by having each of you give just a, a brief um, introduction about who you are, why you're running, what your priorities are, et cetera. Um, and um, I'm just going to note for anyone who's watching, uh, who will watch this recording once we post it, that um, Margot Logan, Logan is um, listed as being Cheryl, but it's Margot. Um, yeah, yeah, computer problems this morning. So I'm at a friend's house. If you hear a dog bark, it's, yeah, yeah, so we'll try to keep quiet. Oh yeah, my neighbors are doing construction. I'm sorry if any of you hear that as well. Okay, no worries. Okay. Um, why don't we start off and go in alphabetical order? So um, Herman, would you mind going first and uh, starting us off? Absolutely. We're going in alphabetical order and I'm first. How yeah. is that even possible with Brooklyn? <laughs> well, I'm, the guy I'm going last names. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. All right, yeah. it's good. <laughs> um, Herman Green, that's spelled H-E-R-M-A-N. Last name Green, G-R-E-E-N. E. Um, tell you a little bit about myself. I've been, let's see, I've got uh, an amazing wife. Um, her name is Nike. We've been married for almost about, about 27 years right now. We have um, four amazing, amazing children. Um, my eldest is uh, 26, 27, somewhere around there. Um, and she's a teacher at Roosevelt. My Middle one is 23. She'll be 24. I got a 22. I got an 18. That'll be 19. I'll try to fast forward through all that. Um, but I've been um, working um, and serving in this community for well over 20 years now doing prison ministry, um, community work, um, community redevelopment work. I've volunteered at Roosevelt, at George, at Vernon, um, John Ball, when it was John Ball before it turned that, then it went to Rosa Parks. I just, I love this community. I love what I do. Um, and I'm excited to be here um, and talk about what we're doing um, because I believe we're all here because we love the kids. So mm. let's go. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Margo, do you wanna go next? Okay, uh, yeah, I'm Margo Logan and running for the board. <clears throat> My uh, whole career has been kind of focused on protecting children. So, and working with children, um, group care. I did group care for six years with uh, 16 to 18 year olds. I was a child protective services investigator for 10 years, uh, four years uh, full time. I uh, subbed in the public schools for uh, seven years. Uh, I had a lot of uh, eyewitnessing from that perspective. I taught in the community uh, recognizing and reporting child abuse for 10 years. Uh, I, I, you know, my whole uh, uh, issue is about the protection of children. And I, I feel like that there's some big concerns in the public schools in general. And I can, I can speak to that. The last 14 years, I've been an analyst, expert witness in civil lawsuits and uh, administrative hearings. And again, mostly focused on uh, children. Uh, some have to do with uh, regulation of businesses, and um, and I'm a, I was raised in the military, so I'm a, the daughter of a U.S. Army intelligence officer who was a photo interpreter, uh, who worked with CIA for six years, five years, uh, and so I grew up in the military schools, and I have seen the difference between that in the military schools. There was total integration. There was no racism. And uh, often for anybody raised in the military, when they go into the civilian schools, um, the military schools have been, been the best. So, so anyway, that's, that's brief. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, and Brooklyn. Uh, I'm Brooklyn Sherman. I use male pronouns. Um, I'm running for school board because, you know, again, I, I'm really passionate about improving our schools. I'm a recent Jefferson graduate. My brother will be going to Roosevelt next year. His name is Berkeley Sherman. 
He's doubly gifted. He's on SPED and TAG. And I was in SPED myself when I was in PPS. And I'm, again, just really concerned, especially with how SPED children make up around 20% of our district. I really want to make sure that they're treated fairly, especially with, you know, how budgets are being handled currently, since we will be getting cutbacks in state funding. And we, we are getting increases, luckily, in federal funding. That's sadly only focused towards COVID. Great, thank you. Um, so each of you sort of hinted at some of this, but I guess I'm interested in finding out what specifically um, uh, just spurred you all to, to run now for, for this position. Um, was there a certain episode or a certain um, uh, priority that you have that um, is why you've decided to throw your hat in the ring? And I guess let's start off, um, let's switch it up and, and Marco, if you could go first and answer that question. Oh yeah, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I ran last year for state representative uh, against Tina Kotek. And when I was subbing in the schools the last couple of years, we had a training that told us and we were directed that if we suspected uh, sex abuse from uh, a school personnel, that we were not to call the police, we were not to call CPS. Instead, we were to report to HR legal counsel. And then uh, in big red letters at the bottom of the training screen, it said, under no circumstances are you to notify the parent or legal guardian. And I'm sorry. So I was trying to figure out, uh, you, uh, we were directed not to notify the parent or the legal guardian. Right. And I'm sorry, where and when? So I went to Tina Kotak because she was my uh, state representative. And I, I got a little bit of information from her assistant at the time. And, and there was some change in the law that came through the teachers union, but I couldn't find out, well, who put together the, this training? And so for six years, off and on, I tried to meet with uh, Tina Kotak and she wouldn't meet with me and she was my representative. And uh, so when her, when that position became open last year, I thought, okay, you know, maybe I'll give this a shot uh, just to try to get it out there. But I was kind of, pretty much on a media blackout in Portland, except for KBU, they interviewed me. So, so that happened and that passed. And then this year when I found out there was a special election and it was like, oh, the board, school board. You know, that, that's another way that if I was on the school board, I could help with that completely. And, so, and I'm sorry, I, I, I missed the part about, so where was this training? Who was conducting it? Uh, I was working in uh, a number of different school di districts, Reynolds and uh, the uh, Multnomah uh, County School District, and uh, so a variety of different uh, schools. And But I think it's a statewide training. But I, at the point that I asked that question, who put together the training, it seemed like the walls went up. And <laughs> so I could never find out who did that training and why it was put together like that because it was in violation of law and I know that because I was a CPS investigator I'm teaching it for 10 years in the community and I couldn't pass the test until I marked uh to report to uh, HR legal counsel so okay um let's see and and so um it's not necessarily specifically about the Portland school district but rather about your interest in this issue as a, as a whole well, I imagine it's the whole school district of all the different school districts, because there, there's a commonality here of, of how, uh, you know, the, the school boards work and they interface and they, they have the same uh, probably training. And a lot of it now is like online. So, and then in 2018, I went to uh, Portland Public Schools and up into Vancouver, just to kind of try to get a read on, okay, I want to see the training dance today. And I got a big reaction. You know, it was like me just showing up and asking a simple, making a simple records request for just the training, which I knew was no more than uh, probably 15 or 20 pages. And I, I got big reactions, not only Portland Public Schools, but Vancouver uh, from their attorney. She came out. <laughs> it was like, you know, I was like, I'm just asking for public records. And I know, I think, uh, is it Therese, or maybe it was you, Helen, uh, somebody there, you're really focused on getting public records. 
and helping. I right. forget who that was. Maybe it was Oregonian Teresa. Oregonian as a whole, and, and Teresa has written numerous Yeah, others. reading your, uh, yeah. your profile. Yeah, yeah, so good on that. Yeah, keep doing that. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Brooklyn, how about you? In terms of why you're deciding to run now for Portland School Board, I guess, what are uh, what kind of tip the scales for you? I've always been interested in politics. I even worked for Teresa Rayford for her mayor bid in 2020. And, and that was a great experience. I enjoyed working alongside Teresa Rayford. But what really inspired me was my friend, um, Kaylin Parsons, who's also a huge political advocate. And he was telling me that, you know, he fears that there's not enough young representation on the school board, especially because this is a privilege. You, you, this is a job you're doing for free. You know, you're volunteering 40 plus hours a week to do this. And, and a lot of young people can't do that. So you don't see representation of recent TPS graduates in the system who can tell you and show what happens to a child after TPS. And I'm running to be that representation, to tell those stories and to help kids understand what will happen to them when they're done with high school and done with the PPS system. And I got inspired mostly by my friend, Kaylin Parsons, who's become my campaign manager now. <laughs> okay. Um, and how would you do that as a board member? I would t tell the kids uh, about what happens to them after they're done with high school. And, and I also have plenty of friends who are still in high school, who are seniors and juniors. And I have tons of friends who are out of high school, who, who are now in college, here in the States and abroad. And know what, and they can talk about what happens, the experience, especially right now, since a lot of colleges are going under. I, I had a friend who, who went to Mills. She tried really hard. She studied a lot to get to Mills, but now they're, the school's falling apart. They're being bought out by Berkeley, I believe, and she's nervous. And, and that's something that never happened in the past. But these children are now going to have to be concerned about issues. Will my college that I want to go to still exist in two years? But I guess I, I'm wondering. And we need younger people to be involved in that narrative. Okay. I guess what I'm wondering is, is um, why is it important to be a school board member in order to um, have that dialogue with kids versus, you know, what would your experience, how would your experiences and your background help inform uh, the school board for changing policy there in, in some way? I guess what would you bring or focus on doing on, on the school board level? It would be someone who can vote for those issues is a big part of it. And someone who's gonna be there at every meeting to talk about it. And as you know, cause we, we do have students who are there but we don't have many ex students. Mm -hmm. Cause Nathaniel Shu, the current student representative he's a senior, he, he, you know, he knows a lot about what's going on with COVID but he doesn't know what it's like to be at PSU or at another university after you know, high school. And the other youth who are activists, a lot of them don't have that experience and I could bring that in. And the same thing like when you want African-American or another minority group's representation on the board, it's so they have an active voice, they're present for every meeting. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Herman, can you talk a little bit about uh, why you decided to, to run for school board now? Yeah, absolutely. Um... If I had to put it all into something, if this pandemic has, has taught us anything at all, right? And, and I've said this before, I've put it, I try to put it everywhere I go. Um, if the pandemic has taught us anything is that our school system, the, the value that it has extends way beyond like the curriculum and the, and the classroom. I mean, the, the schools are literally like, you know, they're like the heart of the community. And, but they're also the, they're like the truest test of what we really believe in and what we value. Every decision that we make in the schools, I mean, from, from the budget that we spend to the, to the allocations, um, to, the, to the policies that review, to the vendor contracts that we have, to, the, to just how, we, how we're prioritizing things that we do with our custodial staff, with our teachers, every decision that we make within our school reflects our, in my opinion, how our kids whether or not they're really a priority or not. And every one of those decisions 
um, have a, a real lasting, lasting impact. And we have to start looking at where we're putting money at. We have to start looking at um, the, the way that we're testing our kids. We have to start looking at, you know, what we're really saying is a priority, what really means something to us and, and why we're doing what we're doing. And we have to keep the, the most marginalized communities, the minority communities. We, we have to keep those communities who have been, who haven't been getting a fair shake at the stick. We have to keep them at the forefront of every conversation that we have. And so I'm running for the, this seat on the board because I want to make sure that every student is represented. I want to make sure that the, from the custodial staff to the nutrition services, I want to make sure that their voices are being heard because the working families, they, they, make, up, they make up this society. And so running for the school board is a place to say, how do our values align? with where we're, we're putting our dollars and what we're talking about. And are we going to be a people that we just wanna be a, a nation where we talk about stuff is important in word, but we don't do it in deed? Or are we going to sit down, start applying the brass tax that says, no, this is important. And we're not going to leave this issue until we do something that shows that we believe that this is important. So we're going to ensure that every child, regardless of their zip code, has an opportunity to, to get the best educational platform opportunity that they can have, regardless of where they live, regardless of how they identify. We're going to make sure that we look at the, the dollars, where we're placing our energy, and we're going to make sure that we make decisions based on them first, not, not what we believe, right? I'm not running for this because I want to put my opinion out there. I'm not running for this because I want people to know what I think. I'm running for this because the community needs me to stand up and make sure that their voice is heard. The community, the teachers, the staff, they need, they need somebody to stand up that they know when they go in to talk, we're going to be talking about their issues and not my own. And we're going to make sure that their issues get heard. And, we're, and we got to be prepared to not just say, okay, we're gonna try something, you know, we're gonna try this. No, we're gonna throw whatever we started, we're gonna throw that whole thing out. We're gonna start all over from the ground up and we're gonna rebuild something that has the marginalized, the minority, the BIPOC community in mind because that was, that's what we said is important. And so my job is going to make sure that we look at the policies and procedures that we have in place, the budget that we have in place and make sure we're doing indeed what we said we want to do in words so okay. great thank you um i want to move on to something that is um you know not a surprise but uh just to focus a little bit in on um the return to in-person instruction and kind of get a sense of what all of you think about the district's plans um and if you were a board member how you might have influenced or what you would have sought to change it. Um, and Brooke, let's see, um, Brooklyn, did you go first? Uh, you haven't gone no, first. No, I have yet to go first. Okay. okay, how about if you take this one then, you know, um, uh, elementary schools in, are returning or have returned this week, middle and high schools, um, schools will be returning uh, in the week of April 19th. What's your view on um, the plan that the district is um, adopted and, and whether it's sufficient or, you know, it, just what is your read on that plan? I believe that we should not try to go back to normal because I think we all know at this point that normal was not good enough. We, we got to improve upon the old system well, and we, and we got to change things. Okay, hold on. I, I guess what I want to know is specifically about the the current plan. Um, about the current not, plan. Right, about just, you know, kind of the, the hybrid plan. Um, that Are you did. talking about, so hybrid and how they discuss issues such as three feet or six feet is correct. Exactly. And just, you know, the, um, you know, how elementary students, for instance, are in, if I'm, in, if I'm remembering this correctly, four days a week for half a day. Um, middle school and high school students have uh, two days a week of about uh, two and a half hours each day. Um, just kind of about this plan. Is this, you know, is this something you would have voted for? Is this something that you think is too aggressive, not aggressive enough? 
No, I would never have gone with a hybrid class. I've been in hybrid classes. They don't work. They, they are unfunctional. Uh, the teachers don't get enough training. I, I was in a hybrid class at PSU. They, they are impractical. And anyone who's ever experienced one would never have voted to have that. I believe we should have stuck to online until the end of the year. And then next year, for next school year, truly made a, a, a more functional in-person format not even considering such things as three feet apart. I believe that it was cruel to even think about doing that to the children as a way to cram more of them into a building. Yeah. I'm also concerned about the Chromebooks and hotspots they handed out. So at the beginning of COVID, they handed out Chromebooks and hotspots to many of the children in need, this way to help them with online education. My brother was one of the kids who received that. They, they will be returning those to PPS at the end of the year. My concern is with the modern form of education, regardless of what job you're going to get in the workforce, you're going to need to know how to use the internet. And all the assignments are now digitalized. They all need D2L. When I was a kid, you, you still were writing on a notebook. And I imagine for everyone else here, it was the same story. My concern is if we take these Chromebooks and hotspots away from the children, it will deny them access to education. And, and I believe we need to keep the Chromebooks and hotspots in the hands of the children, even if it costs us money, because that's important. Those access to the internet is how these children will learn, especially in our modern age. And we have to also understand that uh, having some kids in the classroom and some kids online is not a functioning way of educating. It might sound smart, you know, when you're sitting in the office discussing things, but when you're in the classroom, you'll see that it just doesn't happen. It doesn't work. Okay, thank you. Um, Herman, can you go next in terms of what's, you know, what do you think of the in-person instruction slash hybrid plan that the district has? Well, Helen C, first I'm gonna say right out the gate, I'm not a very political person. And y'all asking all these, these questions, and I, I think y'all doing this because y'all know y'all gonna get a solid answer from me. So I'm, I'm gonna give it to you. I'm gonna give you your 15 second sound bite that you're looking for. Um, and I'm gonna tell you, it's probably one of the biggest mistakes, this, one of the biggest mistakes this district has ever made. Sending kids back before where we're really solid on where everything is landing, saying that we're gonna go three feet instead of six feet when everywhere else is still six feet away. I, I'm just not connect. Portland, Portland Public Schools is sticking with six feet. It's the centers. They are for sticking with it. It's the centers for disease control that says three feet is fine. We we're not sure. There are some schools right now that aren't even sure if all the windows open up all the way so that we can get proper ventilation in the schools. Why are we going? Why are we rushing to go back right now? I believe that our going back to school is more politics than it is for the, the safety and the well-being of the kids. I believe that people are, are tired of, of being at home. They're, they're tired of you know, not being able to send their kids out and, and they, want to, they want to get back to what, what, what normal is. And, and they're trying to like, we need to get this thing moving. And so we're in a rush to, we're in a rush to, to get this gets back. And, and this is a mistake. We're, we do not have right now, we don't have enough custodians in our buildings. We've done an amazing job um, building a lot of our buildings, making them larger and making them prettier and, and making more stuff available to them. And yet we don't have enough custodial staff to, to clean those same buildings and to keep those buildings disinfected and, and free. So now we're talking about, we want to go in and we want to get contracts with different ones who are going to come in and they're going to be contracted to to killing certain spaces but they're not going to be the typical custodial staff they're going to literally be there for no other purpose but to be disinfecting well how are we going to hold those people accountable because they're going to be in the spaces with our kids they're going what are they going to they have they have a run-in they say something there's a harassment how do we deal with that what is what does that look like what are we doing when it when it comes to so they're gonna be coming in, school, in class for two hours or two and a half hours, or then some are four hours, these four and a half days or whatever. But yet some people are still electing to, to stay at home. And so now this teacher, this teacher is still responsible 
to do both online learning for the people that are choosing to, to be online, as well as in-person learning for those that want to come in. And who's, com who's going to be coming in after every one of her classes to make sure that all the desks and everything that was used was wiped down? Is she now responsible for that or he now responsible for that? Who's going to follow these kids when they decide they have to go to the bathroom? Because trust me, they're going to have to go to the bathroom. That's and good. a lot of the kids are going to see this as a time for me to see my friends who I haven't seen. Who's going to be following behind those kids to make sure that the areas that they went, that they kept their masks on, that they um, they wiped down everything that they were, you know, that they put their hands on? Who's going to be following those kids? It's not a problem to simply say, we need to open up the schools. It's when you start letting all these other potential people into the school that we increase our chances for continuing continuing the, the spread of the virus. And we just opened up the schools and y'all may know this better than I do, but there was some reporting that showed that the, a school over on the west side, I believe they've been open for, um, they were open for a couple of days and already had cases of COVID-19. So then they had to send out a letter to say that, hey, we got the virus in the school, but it's going to be okay. If we haven't contacted you directly, you can. then that means your cohort is okay and you can still continue to send your kids to school. Why would I wanna risk that? So personally, my personal opinion is that this is a mistake. We need to take the time to make sure that we have every precaution in place, that we have enough staff, that we have enough support systems, um, that we have all these things in place to keep our kids and our teachers safe before we start coming back to school. And then we need to get ready for a solid safe year on, on next year. But right now we need to be focusing on, on keeping our kids and our staff and our, our workers safe versus we just need to go back to school because I'm tired of being out. And that's how you view it as that that's what's motivating the, the push to, to reopen, that people are-, are I think, uh, I, I personally, again, I'm not a political person, but I believe that the, the rush to go back to school is not taking the safety of the student. It's not taking the safety of the, um, the staff. It's not taking the safety of the, of the workers in the building. It's not making that the, the priority. I don't think they're making the safety the priority. Something else is driving it and it's not the safety and well-being of our kids. Thank you. Um, Margo, how about you? What's your view about the plan to return to in-person instruction? Yeah, I would agree a lot with uh, what Herman has said. And uh, I read the 105 page uh, proposed uh, administrative rules and it is insane. What the teachers would have to do, Herman is exactly right. I mean, it, is just, it would be impossible there'd be no uh, teaching going on. There would just be this, <laughs> I can't even imagine. Uh, and what I told the teachers union, my concern about the safety of the kids has to do with the Portland Public School Building was attacked. Uh, vehicles were destroyed, fires were set. And uh, from my look, and I'm an investigator by my many professions and trade is that to me, that was a warning shot right across the bow of public schools, that if they open, those buildings are wide open. And, and the, the rules that Cape Brown wants to bring in include parents not being able to go into the school buildings, but the teachers union can go into the school buildings. And so there is a huge bigger issue here that I look at, and I know the history of public education. I've studied that. I, I have yet to find one teacher who knows the history of their own profession. And I think the public schools are, it started in 1854, uh, Democratic Com Congress started the public schools and the NEA. And there's a lot of history around what was going on at that time in our country in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s. Um, so I'd like and to I think really institutional cool. racism came out of that. So Brown versus the Board of Education, it was Brown versus the public schools. So I think we have so much that is bubbling up that we don't even see. And I think uh, 
uh, Scott Adams, who does the Dilbert. He's a persuasion guy and, and he's written many books and he's been looking at this. And he, he says that the biggest story that the media is not watching is that the public school system is crashing. And I say, let it crash, let it come back. Brooklyn has some good ideas. Let it come back so that it's competitive. So before 1854, there was public, there was private. There was not this compulsory, you're gonna to go to jail if you don't have your kids in school. So I think uh, we're, we're focusing on this narrow thing. And as far as an emergency, um, and when Cape Brown did this in March in 2020, I immediately got in my car for three weeks. I went around to all the emergency rooms, the urgent care, the test site, and there was nothing going on. There was no emergency in process. And I happened to have to go to my doctor at that time. And I was the only one there. And I, and I asked the person, so checking I, I in. Really I go, like what about that test Margo, site? Margo, I'm sorry. I'd really like to keep this focused on kind of, we don't have a lot of time. So I'd like to keep this focused yeah. on. Um, it sounds like you, you do not support going back to in-person instruction. Uh, is that correct? Well, what I'm saying is there, there has never been an emergency. No child has died in Portland from this 99.9% uh, .9 recovery rate virus. Mm -hmm. Yes, there can be some, a virus, but no child has died. And, and children are, are not uh, at risk. And I, when I talked to the teachers union, it sounded like they were more concerned about themselves being at risk. And, and we're, we're gonna traumatize these children, masking them up, that's trauma. I, I have uh, friends who are involved with children right now and more children are on antidepressants. They are traumatized. And, and you're gonna go put them in a school building where you're going to segregate them in their little cubicles with masks on, it's, we can't do it. We can't do it, but we can rebuild the public schools so that they are competitive with the other options that are out there now. So, thank so, you. And just so I, I'm, I understand, I, I see the, the sign uh, that says no masks on children. I don't quite see what the other one says. Um, uh, this one over here? Right. Uh, public schools hiding sex abuse of students. Okay. And that goes for the Oregonian too, I have to say. <coughs> you hid the sex abuse of Elizabeth Lynn Dunham and the public schools are hiding sex abuse of kids. And so I really just want to open up and it, the schools just need to be totally transparent and they're hiding records. You try to get uh, public records. I mean, the, the person who's working that, on that on the Oregonian, I helped the Columbia newspaper one year. It, it, it took them almost, uh, I think three months to get records. And I know how the government hides records. I was a public records coordinator. That was one of my jobs. So there's just this whole secrecy that is in all of our governmental agencies and the public schools are, are government, you know? Let's, let's go back to choice. And we can, we can build a good public school system. It'll and, start smaller, but then we have choice. A um, couple of things I, I do wanna follow up on fairly quickly. So your, your opposition to masks on children is because um, you feel it's traumatizing or you feel like it's unnecessary? Yeah, there, no child has died from this. And over, no, it's gonna be a year and a half, no child has died. And you know, you're asking of children the child develop, in child development, children need to see faces. They need to that, you know, if you're put making a whole society that that doesn't have a face. So I'm children need that. When you say no ch child has died, um, you're talking about just Portland, correct? Yeah, I'm talking. To, yeah, I'm talking about Portland. Yeah, and it's been almost a year and a half. And okay. And, 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 and we're acting like the children are, are uh, you know, are a threat to the teachers. That's what I got when I uh, was talking to the teachers union. There was hardly any concern spoken about children and the trauma, you know, being traumatized. And now you're going to have school buildings open. You've got all this violence that's happened in Portland for over a year. I mean, and, and, and they're, they're, they attacked a black business. 
You know, I mean, it's got to stop. I mean, it just has to stop. Okay. We, got, we, got, we got to protect these kids and we've got to nurture these kids. We can't have them traumatized. All right, I'd like to move on a little bit. Um, okay. And let's start, uh, I think, with Herman. Um, what do you expect for the fall? Do you, uh, at this point, do you support full return to in-person instruction this fall? Uh, Helen, let me make sure I'm understanding you. When you're referring to this fall, you are uh, referring to next sept well, this September. Correct. Well, actually, we're in Portland, so school actually starts the last week of August now. That's true. Yes. Which is <laughs> terrible because I need that extra week. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So I believe that we need to reevaluate. Like, I really think we need to take a look at where we're at. Um, prior to just opening up. I think it, it would be safe to say, okay, we want to have a plan um, to open up, to fully open up in the fall. Um, but in that, that would just be one part of a plan. I think with that, we would also want to start looking at, um, start going to our, our union, start going to like the, I'm, I'm really harping and saying about the custodial union because we need to clean it. But I think we need to see a 30% at least, uh, at least, a 30% increase in our custodial staff before we start saying that, okay, we've got, you know, we're ready to go back. Let's start making sure that we've got enough custodial staff to keep our buildings clean. Let's make sure um, that we have enough um, nutrition services workers and we have different things in place so that the nutrition services workers, they have the, um, the safety. Excuse and the me, Herman. Excuse me. Margo, could you remove the sign? It's very distracting when someone else is speaking. Oh, well, since it says Cheryl, I thought I better put my name up there. It's okay. It's distracting. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead, Herman. Can you I'm put sorry. my name up there? <laughs> um, but I, I think we need to really, we really need to look at, instead of just saying, we're going to open up on this day, the plan should be, we're going to open up when we, when we see this in place, we, got, we know that we can keep the buildings clean. We're gonna open up when we know that we have um, enough disinfectant or we're going to have a plan to, to keep the classrooms clean. We're going to open up when we've got a, man, um, a plan to manage um, what the teachers are gonna do in between classes. We're gonna open up when we've got a plan to, to manage how we're going to interact or manage the interaction of kids in the hallways. We're, it shouldn't just simply be we're going to open up on this date because then the priority becomes the date of opening versus we're going to list out the different things that we need to have in place prior to being able to open safely for all students. And then when we have those things in place, then we're going to open up. That changes how we look at things and that changes the priority. So now the priority is no longer September. Because right now, if, it, if we just said we're going to open in the fall, then we're just rushing to get to say September. If we change the goalpost to say we're going to open up when we have the things in place to keep our students safe, to keep our staff safe, to keep our teachers safe, to keep our buildings safe, now we've got a different thing to do. And it's not based on uh, a time factor. It's based on uh, a metrics of what are the metrics needed to keep people safe. So what are they for you? So in terms of, for instance, you've got, um, there's uh, the general public in Oregon can start um, uh, receiving or at least um, making appointments for the vaccine starting April 19th. Um, what, what are the specific metrics that you need to see in place before opening for full in-person instruction? So I, I guess, again, I would be looking at one, I, I do believe in um, the, I haven't gotten a vaccination yet, but I believe in the science and I believe in the, the importance of the vaccination of keeping us all safe. And I, I do believe that all of those who um, at most risk, the highest risk and can get it, should get it. And so um, I, I do believe that we should be at a place where we could 
um, we can reach that herd immunization. But I don't think that that has to be the only defining factor to say that we can come back to school because we don't know what um, medical issues someone else might have to keep them from getting the, um, the vaccination. So I wanna keep that in mind. So that shouldn't be the only factor, but that should be, that should be one. Are we closer to that, that herd immunization number or, or not? We should be looking at, do we have the things in place to keep the school clean, disinfected, so that we can, we can know that, you know, this ventilation is good. Is, have we made sure that the ventilation in all of the school buildings, not just the newer school buildings, but some of the older school buildings that kids are gonna be going back to, that they have um, clean, clear ventilation systems that are going to be able to process air, that we can open up windows where we need to open up windows. Do we have that in place? There's, we need to start looking at those types of, of metrics. Um, what I all of those things. Right, and my understanding is that the ventilation issue has been, I mean, the district has said that every classroom is going to be evaluated for ventilation they've ordered uh, or are receiving uh, filtration systems, et cetera, or filters that, um, to meet that. Right, need. but they also have a, a report that says um, that the, the schools are considered moderately clean. Mm -hmm. And so when you start looking at moderately clean, I equate it this way. Again, I'm not a politician. And so yeah, I, I use analogies. I, I use a lot of analogies. If you're going, if you're gonna, if you're sick, right? And, and you gotta have open heart surgery where they're gonna be opening you up. Do you want the, if you got to choose, if you had a choice of choosing, do you want the doctor who got a C minus or do you want the one who got an A++? If I get to choose what doctor I'm gonna get, I want the doctor who's got the, the A++. It's not that the other doctor isn't qualified. It's just, I feel like this doctor with his specialty might be a little bit more qualified. Moderately dirty or moderately clean might work in some spaces, but when I'm putting my child's life on the line, when I, I'm putting my child's safety on the line, I, I'm putting their, their, like, this is my future. This is my tomorrow. When I'm putting that on the line, do I want to put that on the line for the C minus, the moderately clean? Or do I, if I get a choice, do I want to make sure that it's the one with the A++? I think we would all say, I want the one with the A++. Why are we settling for moderately clean? instead of putting the things in place to get us above that. I don't feel like we should settle. I feel like we should not say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go with this because you know, it's, it's not trash. There's not trash on the ground. We're, we're settling. And I, I don't feel like we should be settling when it comes to the safety and the well-being of our kids and our, and our, our working families. I don't think we should settle. If we can make a choice, I feel like we need to make the best choice. And with that, it, it's a tough one. It's a tough one, but I, I feel like we should, we should make it. Can I follow up on that, Herman? I'm just, I'm Laura Gunderson. I'm sorry I came in late to the meeting, but I'm just curious then if, if we're going to meet these metrics uh, that I think from your previous answer that you felt that maybe we wouldn't have come back at all this school year. And again, if these metrics you apply for buildings to open up in the fall, of next year of 21-22. Do you feel that the district is provi providing though in the meantime, uh, adequate educational and socially developmentally correct uh, services to all students in Portland? Are they doing a good enough job if they don't come back to provide equal education and other services for all students in Portland? All right, that's a completely um, different question. <laughs> but I'm a I'm gonna give it a stab nonetheless. I feel like there were there were already students within our school system who were who were struggling. COVID nineteen and the and the and the pandemic and the separation from school made that disparity even worse. I feel like as a school district, we're we may be trying um, to we're maybe trying to meet the needs of all the students. But without that ability to, to really be with the student, without that ability to, you know, to, 
there are a lot of kids, you know, it's, this is a catch point too, because there were a lot of kids who were, you know, avoiding abuse at home because they were able to come to school. I, I think we, we know that there were a lot of, there are a lot of families who, you know, they, school was what they needed to, to be able to, to be able to move forward. And they're not getting that, they're not getting that at home. And so you're, you're in this paradigm because the district can only do so much. They're a school system and their, their job is to try to educate, but they can only educate the ones that have the ability to show up to the platforms and the mediums that they're, that they have available to them. And so are all the kids being, are all the kids getting the same advancement? Are, th are they all learning equally? I think the, the short answer to that is no, they're not because not everybody is able to take advantage of all the different, the different resources that, that are available to them. Not everybody has all the same support systems behind them to, to keep them going throughout a day. Um, this, so the, the short answer is not, is that they're not, but the longer answer is that the question that you're asking is a much more in-depth question that goes beyond simply the school system and what the school system is providing. What the school system made available to uh, a lot of families were a lot of the additional resources that came with the student being in school. It came, the, the, the resource of having the, the community clothes closet, the resource of having the, the food bank, the, the resource of having the, the nutrition services, the resource of having the, the sun programs in school, the resource of having the, the mentors in, in school. The, the school building was a place where you could put a lot of the, the social service needs that a family needs in one space. And so because kids are not able to re return to in in-person learning, they're missing out on a lot of those big, big ticket items that were helping them to get through, get through the day. So the short answer is no, not, not all kids are benefiting from the same, but the, the real answer is that that is a much more complex situation than just simply saying, are they not getting it? Is the, the district not providing it? The district can't provide it because how do, how does the district navigate all those other pieces? And so I just feel like I, I appreciate, Ms. Laura, your, your question, but what that really should be is it should open us up to a much, a much deeper dialogue around how do we ensure that all the students that we're serving, regardless of their zip code, are now getting the, the resources that they had prior to um, the, the pandemic, if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Um, Margo, can you um, please answer the question about uh, what your expectations would be for fall in-person instruction? Um, this, well, I think I've already answered it. The school should, should be open, totally. No masking, no distancing. Uh, you're gonna have to have a plan for the kids who have been traumatized out of all of this. And uh, right now what's happening is just gonna provide further um, traumatization to the kids and the teachers as well. I, I just can't imagine. Um, and my take has been that the teachers aren't so afraid of COVID as they are of all the other things that uh, are happening now, all the violence that has happened in Portland. Uh, that is a bigger concern. These buildings are wide open. And you've got kids who for, for a year now have been on the streets participating in violence. And if they haven't been, there's other kids who've been home watching the violence. Uh, there is certainly an anti-authority um, dynamic that is happening in Portland for now over a year. And you're gonna have some of those kids come back into the school. And you know the school teachers, uh, and this is the reason that um, the schools were uh, started in 1854 was to make obedient, submissive citizens out of us. And it's also the reason that they, they were to dumb us down so that we hate reading. I mean, the way that they teach reading in school, kids end up hating reading. I have a personal experience with my, uh, with my oldest grandson. I helped him learn to read when his teacher couldn't do it. 
So it's a much bigger issue and, you, and we just keep narrowing down to uh, <laughs> this uh, pandemic thing. And, and it's, there's, not a, there's no emergency. People, everything needs to open up. And this is just destroying so many people's lives. But on the other hand, like I said, the biggest story that's going to come out of this year is the, the destruction of the public school system. There is more homeschooling. It's like increased 25% in some states. There, there's educational pods. I talked to one father. He's spending $2,000 a month to educate his child now. So I think for the parents that uh, you know didn't have one parent that who could, who could stay home to do the homeschooling, I think those parents should keep track of how much they've spent, how much time they have spent. And I think that uh, dollars now need to follow the student and not the, the school districts. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, open up, go back to competition. I mean, you can re redo the schools and there's a, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, uh, ideas here from Brooklyn and from uh, Herman, you know, he, he's done a lot of great stuff. I, I looked at his Facebook page. You know, he's done a lot of great stuff with the, with the schools and, uh, and uh, yeah, and, and, and Brooklyn's right. We, we don't listen to the kids. You know, uh, we've, got, we've got the kids in there because we're trying to make them, it's like a prison. I mean, when I, when I subbed, I was like, oh my gosh, parents do not know what goes on in the schools once those doors close. I've seen kids traumatized. I've seen the emotional uh, uh, environment. You know, and I've seen teachers be stressed, you know, and that I worked uh, lunch and recess duties. You know, there, there were adults who had no idea how to manage a group of kids. There, you know, there was uh, uh, rumors that a kid's gonna get attacked on the playground, you know, so I'm trying to manage all this stuff that's happening. Kids are getting hurt. You know, there's all kinds of uh, conflict between counselors and nurses and principals. I, I've seen it play out. I've been in the teacher's lounge when the teachers are dissing the parents, you know, and they're dissing and they're making fun of kids. There is a whole thing that has been built up now for a hundred years. Brown versus the Board of Education. It was Brown, it was a lawsuit against public okay. schools, not so private far, schools. Right. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I go wide because I have just so much historical information and I just, you know, Go to my Facebook page and I'll be posting stuff on there. And I wasn't trying to do anything except it says Cheryl. So I wanted to be and sure you know that what? Where my name is there. <laughs> you got it. And you know what? I think it's fine. The recording will be fine because it's actually just all the other participants are just a strip. So they won't, it, it, I don't think it'll be oh, confusing to people. My just, name will be on there? Well, no, but I think it won't be confusing because. Okay. Um, I'm Margo. <laughs> Um, Brooklyn, um, if you can talk a little bit about uh, just, you know, what you foresee for a fall, what you would want to see in terms of instruction. Um, there's been a lot talked about already. I, I guess where I'll begin is I'm not a medical expert. I, I have no clue what's going to happen with COVID-19 by the fall. Ho hopefully in a, in a dream world, everything will be over and, and all the COVID will be gone. But, but I, I don't know. I'm not a medical expert. I'm a business student. I have no clue how that's going to handle virus-wise. What I do know is, so in PPS, Green talked about sun school in particular is one thing he mentioned, is sun school is leaving Portland Public Schools also because they're county ran. They're going to other school districts in our county. And so we're losing a lot of our after-school activities as well. And we're going to continue losing them. And after COVID-19, the pandemic as a whole, a lot of private entities that would do after school activities for the children are going out of business. So we need to increase after school activities yeah. because the county's not going to help us. And these private companies are no longer there to help us. So we need to make up for that as well and understand that we're losing sun schools in our district just because the county only has so much money. They, they're going to go to the poorest communities, and we're just currently not that. As, as well, we have to also remember the trauma. Uh, I, in my junior year of high school, I, I was in a PCC class since at Jefferson, they allow you to take those. And, and there was an active school shooter outside of my classroom once. And when the shooter 
um, was done shooting. Luckily, no one was injured in, in the incident. They, they told us we had to just sit there and go right back to class. I'll tell you, for that next half hour of class, the only thing I was watching was the clock. I didn't know any, I wasn't paying attention at all. And yes, here in PPS, luckily none of our kids have been injured or gotten, you know, died of COVID. But they're still going to be traumatized. They're still going to be scared. They're still going to be sitting there watching the clock like I was. Mm -hmm. And we got to understand that. And we got to make sure that whatever we do, that they're not sitting there watching the clock, that they're there learning. And we, we again, we, we also have to think about the janitorial union, as Green was talking about as well. We're currently union busting. That, that's what's going on. And we, we, like to, we like to teach our kids about unions, I know, especially talking about how Amazon, how poorly they treat their staff. And if we want to teach the kids this narrative, then why are we being so cruel to the janitorial union? We're union busting. We're getting private contractors to come in and, and do and handle COVID. We could hire more of them. We could wait, hire more. We could work with them and expand and give them you know, COVID pay. They worked hard. Many of them were given fewer hours. I would talk to one individual who mentioned that he drove here an hour to get to work, worked only for an hour because they only gave him an hour and then had to drive another hour to get back home. That's them actively trying to convince him to leave our school district. That's mm -hmm. cruel and unjust. And we need to make sure that we're not doing that to our janitorial staff. And we gotta, if we're gonna t t preach to our children that unions are good and, and that we should treat our workers fairly, then we need to actually act upon it. Thank you. Um, uh, I think we probably have time for really only, and this, <laughs> I wanna hit this question as quickly as possible. Um, so we'll probably go over a little bit. Um, at this point, um, but it is a really important question. I'm hoping each of you can just kind of um, uh, talk about briefly. Um, and I guess we will start with uh, Margo on this. Um, you know, just the past year has shown us uh, just, a, or we've seen over the past year, a, a community-wide understanding of the need to change um, our institutions, some of our practices um, that contribute to systemic racism. I guess I'm wondering what specific changes are, are you seeking or would you seek to help fulfill that at PPS? You know, yeah. I, I guess kind of, you, you've talked actually quite a bit about that. So maybe for you, it's more specific. Um, it's interesting because you were saying that, you know, something along the lines of, you know, let the system burn down and yet you're- oh, I didn't say burn. <laughs> okay. didn't say burn. <laughs> or crash down or just, yeah. but, you know, <laughs> and so, but so as a, but you're seeking to be a member of the board that oversees its um, uh, just its success. So I yeah. guess how do you square those two? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. That is a great ending question. So uh, we are not teaching uh, black history in our schools. Uh, one year, I uh, at the beginning of February, I subbed at Arata Creek. And they had me do the school bulletin board. I'm like, well, great, you know. So I put up Malcolm Little. I put up Cassius Clay. Uh, I, I put up uh, Claudette Colvin. Uh, I put up the kids at the lunch counter. And of course, uh, Martin Luther King and, and Rosa Parks. As I was putting that up, uh, a school employee came by and looked at me and went, you know, it's hard enough controlling these kids. And you put that up there. I was like, whoa, you know. So at the end of the uh, February, I got another uh, sub job at that school. <laughs> they took down Malcolm Little, Malcolm X, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, uh, Claudette Colvin, and the kids at the lunch counter. Well, Claudette Colvin, it was the kids. It was the black kids who started the modern um, civil rights movement. It was black girls, 15 year old girls who were saying no on the bus. And when they hauled Claudette Colvin off the bus, she was, uh, she was also pregnant. She was schooled the police officers about the constitution and the bill of rights. I mean, she no holds barred. So what happened was, and you can read Branch Taylor, Taylor Branch, uh, American the King years. Um, they just weren't comfortable with Claudette. She was darker skinned. 
So Rosa Parks actually was uh, the one who went on the school bus. She was more middle class. She was lighter skinned. She was part of the system. So uh, and Claudette you Colbert- You just gotta keep this focused, focused yeah, on just, you know, what, right, you're talking about- yeah, so I'm, I'm saying that, that, that the schools are not uh, teaching uh, black mm -hmm. history. And so Claudette Colvin and the other girls, their cases went to the United States Supreme Court, not Rosa Parks. So I'm just giving you a very concrete example of racism in the public schools. So uh, we're not teaching uh, the, the accurate history. And, um, and like I said, the Brown versus the Board of Education, it was directed at public schools. So there is an institutional racism going on in the schools, all the public schools. And that's what I'm saying. And I can help with that. I mean, I, I love history. I, I have been connected to all kinds of uh, diverse communities in my life. And I can help the public schools go to the original intent of, of how things unfolded. Oh, here's a good history. Portland Public Schools, they were integrated in 1872, 1872. 1868, there was only about 500 black families. Uh, uh, a father, a shoemaker, he brought a suit against uh, the, the schools. And then by 1872 with the 14th Amendment, all men of all colors voted to integrate the Portland Public Schools. So but we don't know that history. We have some actually good history. And, and, and I'm tired of the media uh, showing black people like they're victims. I mean, you got videos out there of people thinking that, that blacks don't know how to get a driver's license, to get ID or how to use a computer. I mean, that's where this is gone. And it's coming from the white culture uh, and it's coming from the media who controls the narrative. I mean, the, the black culture is, is so rich. They have such strength, they have such class. You, you have you know, businessmen and business women in the history of the whole country after the Civil War and the first, one of the first millionaires was a black woman. So, okay, thank you. I can help with that. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure um, Herman can help with it. <laughs> and, and Brooklyn too. <laughs> uh, Brooklyn, I think you're next. Um, the same question, just, you know, in the past year, we've seen this community-wide recognition of that fundamentally institutions and practices need to change. What would you do if on the school board uh, to, help, um, to help make that change at PPS? Uh, I'm hearing a lot of discussion about how to expand African-American history, but I'm, I'm getting concerned about Latino history, about Asian-American history. <laughs> I believe those are not being discussed enough as well. And I personally, in my high school experience, they taught us about the Brown versus the Board of Education. We, we watched movies about Malcolm X. Um, those were talked about in my school experience. I can't speak for every school in the district, mm -hmm. but I know for, but we didn't talk about Latino history. We didn't talk about gentrification towards the Japanese community here in Portland. Like historically, um, Chinatown here in Portland used to be um, Little Tokyo. They rechanged, they changed the name when they moved all the Japanese Americans out of Portland. Those were things that were not taught to me though in, in school. Yeah. And I feel oftentimes when they do talk about minority history, it's always on the federal level. It's never on the local level. And, and oftentimes we don't even talk about the local level at all. And, and, and as well, mm -hmm. a lot of times they repeat the history. Like for example, when I was in school, we read Howard Zim every year. Uh, you don't need to read Howard Zim four times in a row. I'll tell you that much. You, you read it once, you, you get the information. And, and I think it is a sign that we really do need to think about how do we teach history? Are the history teachers communicating with each other? So each year expands on what was taught last year. And are we actually educating the kids about all their issues? Because I felt like when I was in school, they never talked about my history too. You know, my, my father is Jewish. My mom moved to the States from Canada. And I felt like the only time I ever personally heard my own history and when I was in PPS was they one time did a unit for a week on the Seven Day War. And that's the only time I personally felt like I heard my own history. And I think it, it's not just African-Americans that are getting the short end of the stick here. It's everyone. 
And we need to also not just do federal history, it needs to be local, state, and county. Great, thank you. And Herman, uh, same question for you. Uh, I guess, what would you do as a member of the school board to kind of help address changes in institutions or policies that you think need to be um, uh, amended? Sorry, Herman. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. I believe as a um, as a district, we do a, a great job a great job throwing money at stuff. Um, what I'd like to see us do um, a better job is um, at is making sure we're throwing money at the right stuff and the stuff that's really important to us. If we want to start looking at um, systemic racism and how it's working out within our schools then we have to start asking ourselves the, the question of how are we uplifting and how are we supporting and how are we building up the, the BIPOC community that's, that's already there? How are we um, making sure that, what are we doing to make sure that their voice is being heard? What are we, make, what are we doing to, or where are we allocating our dollars? Where are we allocating our contracts? Where, where are we showing that we want to we want to end this issue that we believe to be true? Um, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again. You wanna know what's important to somebody? Show me, um, show me your bank account and where you spend your time. And I'll show you, I'll show you what's important to you. If we wanna, if we truly want to do something about the systemic racism that we're seeing within our, our school system, then Let's uncover the, the budget. Let's look at the budget. Let's be transparent with the budget. Let's be honest about where we're at and then be honest about what it's going to take to get us where we need to go, understanding that it's not, it's not going to change overnight, but we can make gradual changes that will get us there in time. Let's start looking at how we're spending our dollars, who we're working with, how we're supporting. Do the um, BIPOC teachers and staff that we have now how are we valuing them? How are we letting them know that, that they're important, that their voice is necessary, and that we, we want more of what they have, what they offer, and then how are we highlighting that? When we start making the changes for the, for the families and the, the community and the staff that we already have now, then we won't have to worry about delivering the message because they'll go out and they'll tell other people about, I know that they care about me there. I know that they lift me up there. I know that they want me to be there. And this is how I know. So we have to start looking at how we're showing that we want to end this and we can begin. I don't know, I've never ran for a public office. And so I've never sat on a, a school board and I don't know all the ins and outs of what they currently have in place. But one of the things that I would want to make sure that we do is that we, we look under the hood of that and we get real honest and transparent with the families and the communities that we're called to serve. And we start making intentional changes by acknowledging where we fall in short. And then this is where we're gonna, how we're gonna go forward. And if we do that, then it'll happen. It's going to take time, but it will happen. It's happening now, it's happening now, but we can speed up the rate, I believe. Great. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for making time to be with us today and for being uh, so generous with your time. I know we've gone well over the, the hour that I promised, um, but I really appreciate it. Um, I may have some follow-up questions and we'll uh, check in with you individually. Um, and if you all can remember to just send me uh, a headshot and your age, if you haven't done so already, that would be great. But thank you, we'll be in touch um, and uh, I, I appreciate the conversation today. So. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks very much, everybody. Yeah. Bye -bye. Have a good day. Part of this video.